Thanks for coming out. It's a beautiful day. We would all, we can all agree together we would rather be outside. Thank you for being inside for a little bit. I'm going to read just a little bit from the preface of this book, which is called I Wasn't Out Cold, But I Was Out, and it's an attempt to sort of set up what the book is about. It begins with the fact that I've had a clipping on my wall for many years, which is a, just a game story that's about a game between the New England Patriots and the Miami Dolphins, and there's a player named Kevin Falk who gets tackled, and after the game he's asked about this tackle because he's motionless on the ground for quite some time. Quote, I wasn't out cold, but I was out, said Falk. Asked if he remembered lying on the ground, he said, no, I don't, so I must have been out. I knew that something was wrong with me. I knew that, like, it wasn't normal. I didn't have that same normal feeling when I got up. I thought it was funny. That would be the simplest way to explain why I brought the story home and cut out the section in question and taped it to my wall. I thought it said something elemental about athletic delusion, the absurd and pitiful ways players hide from the truth of their va vocation that they earn ungodly sums of money and acclaim for demolishing each other. I assumed, in other words, a posture of ironic distance, which is what Americans do to avoid the corruption of our spiritual arrangements. Ironic distance allows us to separate ourselves from the big, complicated moral systems around us, political, religious, familial, to sit in judgment of others rather than ourselves. It's the reason as we zoom into the twilight years of our imperial reign that reality TV has become our designated guilty pleasure. But here's the thing. You can run from your own subtext for only so long. Those spray-tanned lunatics we happily revile are merely turned-out versions of our private selves, the horrors we hide from public view. What I mean is that there's a deeper reason I cut out those paragraphs a dozen years ago and carried that little square of newsprint with me through three different moves, each time affixing it to a spot right over my desk. I told myself it was just a macabre little talisman, a window into the dissonant psyches of famous barbarians. Then, a few months ago, around the time my own mother suffered an acute and terrifying insult to her brain, the truth landed. The passage wasn't about Falk and his brethren. It was about me. It was about the 40 years I'd spent as an ardent football fan, about my refusal to face the complicity of my own joy in seeing men like Kevin, Kevin Falk concussed. I knew that something was wrong with me. This little book is a manifesto. Its job is to be full of obnoxious opinions. For example, I happen to believe that our allegiance to football legitimizes and even fosters within us a tolerance for violence, greed, racism, and homophobia. I recognize that voicing these opinions will cause many fans to write off whatever else I might have to say on this subject as a load of horse shit, shoveled by someone who's probably wearing a French sailor suit and whistling the Soviet national anthem. Before you do so, let me reiterate, I am one of you. So please, before you set this book down or quietly remit it to the poor soul in your life who, who thought it might make an interesting gift, please consider one final obnoxious opinion. I happen to believe that football in its exalted moments is not just a sport, but a lovely and intricate form of art. Mostly this book is a personal attempt to connect the two disparate synapses that fire in my brain when I hear the word football the one that calls out who's playing, what channel, and the one that murmurs, shame on you. My hope is to honor the ethical complexities and the allure of the game. I'm trying to see football for what it truly is. What does it mean that the most popular and unifying form of entertainment in America in 2014 features giant muscled men, mostly African American, engaged in a sport that causes many of them to suffer brain damage? What does it mean that our society has transmuted the intuitive physical joys of childhood, run, leap, throw, tackle, into a corporatized form of simulated combat? That a collision sport has become the leading signifier of our institutions of higher learning and the undisputed champ of our colossal athletic industrial complex? I knew that, like, it wasn't normal. So what was it? So that's sort of the prospectus for the book. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm Greg Easterbrook, um, and I'll balance off that very high level of literary erudition by telling you <laughs> a joke. Uh, this joke requires you to use the R word, but there's no other way to tell the joke. There's a man and woman couple 
who are passionate Redskins fans. They go to every game. They've been to every game for 30 years, good and bad. And one day the New England Patriots or some hot team are in town, and the guy shows up without his wife. And he sits down, stares glumly into space. The guy who sat next to him for 30 years shows up and sits down and says, hey, where's your wife? And the man says, I regret to say that my wife has passed away. This is a long moment of silence. And the guy looks at the empty seat. He says, this is a big game. Wasn't there anybody in your family or your neighbors or your friends who wanted that, wanted that ticket? And the guy says, oh, they all went to her funeral. Nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, my, my book is also about football reform. Steve's is impressionistic and literary minus packed with facts um, and, and, and involves football at the professional college and high school level. And I suppose my most important contention is that the lower down the chain you go, the more important the issues become. Nobody wants an NFL player to get injured. Uh, of course not, but there's only 2,000 of them, and they're, they're adults who assume a risk and are paid very well in return for the risk that they assume. You get you step down to the college level, there are 60,000 players there, and the big shame of college football to me is not that players aren't paid. I don't think that's the ideal solution. The big shame of college football is at the Division One level, only 55% of the players graduate. If most... You'd never have 100% graduation, but if most of them got bachelor's degrees, that would be fair recompense for their labors on the field. So the system, far too much emphasis on victory and not enough on education. You step down to the high school level, high school and youth football, there you have three to three and a half million, almost all boys, a handful of girls, but depending on which number you believe, there's at least three million, maybe three and a half million. And there, you can certainly learn things from high school football. It can be a great experience. I played in high school, one of my sons did, one of my sons went on to play in college. Boys learn self-discipline, teamwork, they can learn important lessons from playing football, but they take all the neurological risks in, in, in almost all cases in return for nothing at all, since you know, one, if you look at any high school, group of high school varsity players, one in 1,000 will eventually play in the NFL. Uh, less than one in 50 will get any kind of recruiting boost to college, whether it's a scholarship or an athletic admission letter. So if you look at youth and high school football, whatever rewards you're going to get from the sport has to come when you're in youth and high school football because the chances are you won't go, go on. And as I say, for, for, for many boys and a handful of girls, it is a really great experience. But you balance that great experience with the risk of head injury in a society that's ever more based on education. The idea of having millions of young people smashing each other in the head on a regular basis just cannot be a good idea. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that and say this book ends the final chapter is a is a very complicated reform program, maybe too complicated. I, I go through a lot of possible things that can be done financially in education, taxpayer subsidies we could certainly talk about to reduce those, but change the structure of education, change the way the game itself is played to make it less risky. Risk will never be eliminated, but many things could could be done to reduce risk. Think ways that football can be made, my phrase is, just as exciting and popular but no longer notorious. I think it is possible, and I think given all the public attention to football, maybe we're in the early stages of, of that happening. But uh, that summarizes what I had to say. So. Yeah. So we're done. Yeah. We're done, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We're, we're most interested in taking questions, um, but we are going to talk a, a little bit, and then hopefully if you have questions. Otherwise, we're just going to sit in stunned silence, which is <laughs> what I do at home. Um, one study that – so I didn't know a lot about football. I was just a big fan, and I was done some sports reporting, but I just did not know a lot about it. And what I did is I went – when I decided I was going to write this book, I uh, read Greg's book and read a bunch of other books, uh, all of which I try to acknowledge and, and uh, sort of thank people – so that people will find their way to, for instance, Greg's book was incredibly helpful for me in trying to have a factual basis for understanding how the game functions. But also what's happening in football right now is that medical science is catching up with it. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening that are causing a lot of notoriety, but medical science is the main thing is that we now understand exactly what's happening inside those helmets which we didn't for many years. And players who are understandably very prideful were reluctant to talk about uh, their brain injuries, their cognitive function. One of the most terrifying studies that's been done um, was done at Purdue University. They wanted to find out what's the effect of football on high school students. After all, high school students' skeletal and neurological systems aren't fully developed. And the game has gotten more and more violent over the years for simple physics reasons, mass times acceleration, 
We thank Carl Lee.